Well, uh, I'm pretty excited about the title tonight because I think it's kind of witty and I'm usually not good at titles. But before I give that to you, um, I want to open up with a story. I usually like to, to do that. And so um, I used to work with a guy named Mr. Leonard. And um, he was a truck driver, really nice guy, really humble guy. And he was one of those guys that, man, when he walks in a room, you don't notice him because he's loud or you don't notice him uh, because he, he demands or commands attention. You notice him because it's like he's, he's got a lot of character about him and it just exudes from him. Have you guys ever met somebody like that? Man, they just have a lot of character and so they grab your attention. Well, that's how Mr. Leonard, that's how he was and that's how he is. And uh, I didn't always know him. I was about 17 years old when I met him. Now, I was working at the place that he ended up getting hired at. And um, we were in need of a truck driver for a really long time. We were short one truck driver. And it was an equipment company. So a lot of times things had to be shipped off kind of far away. And um, if, you're, if you're down one guy, that's a big deal for those of you familiar with that industry. And so, man, we were looking for so long. Well, finally... We find Mr. Leonard. Well, come to find out, um, give you a little background of his circumstance during that time. He was looking forever. He had lost a job. Um, the, the company he was working for got shut down. And, uh, he was, he was really almost depleted of his savings account. And, you know, I know some of you, some of you guys and, and ladies can, y'all can relate to that, especially in the economy that we're in now. But Mr. Leonard, man, he, he was so appreciative of his job, um, when he finally got it. And he had been looking for six months. And so he took a huge cut in pay just to come work with us. And so I'd notice, man, Mr. Leonard, he kept busy all the time. If he didn't have a, a run to go deliver a piece of equipment, he would start cleaning his truck. If his truck was spotless, he'd grab a broom and he'd be sweeping in the shop. If, if everything was swept clean, he had no runs and, and the truck was spotless, he was finding something to do. And he was a good worker. He was a man of integrity. And um, I also noticed, though, I was younger, so I didn't naturally hang out with the guys in their 40s, you know. But I noticed that there was a group of, of guys that, man, they didn't like, they didn't really care for Mr. Leonard. Um, and I didn't really get why, but I knew the M.O. of these guys. And these guys were the guys that if there was five of them, two of them would go take a nap. And the other three would kind of watch, make sure the boss didn't come while they were sleeping. And that, that was the good old boy club, you know. Something, nobody in here does that, I'm sure. Um, but then if they would take lunch, man, and another guy knew he was going to be late coming back for lunch, they'd go punch the time clock. You know, they'd get into to gossip about the work around the workplace. And uh, Mr. Leonard never took place and took part into that. And one time we're in the break room. And I was eating with Mr. Leonard and a couple other guys. And I think the final straw for him was we had this rule that you can't, we weren't supposed to close the back portion of the shop until 10 after 5. But when the boss wasn't there, people would shut down 15 till. And so when it was Mr. Leonard's time to shut down, he, uh, he didn't shut down until 10 after 5. So the next day, a bunch of the guys told him, look, man, you know, you, you're really skating on thin ice. Uh, not wanting to go along with the program, um, y- your job's going to get kind of difficult because nobody's going to want to help you out around here. And I'll never forget Mr. Leonard's response. I was just a fly on the wall eating my lunch. And um, and he just said, he said, you know what? I want nothing more than to be friends with all my coworkers. He said, but there's something that takes priority over that. And he said, that's my wife and my kids. And I need my job. And I'm thankful my boss gave me my job. And he said, and so if you guys wouldn't mind, don't blackball me. I'm just trying to do my job, and I'm trying to do it right. And, man, I never, I never forget his response. Nobody blacklisted him. Nobody blackballed him. But it was, it was a straight-up response full of integrity. And in other words, he just said, look, man, I'm going to keep doing what I did yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I'm not changing that. And so I love the character of Mr. Leonard. And I was thinking when I was reading in, in Luke, It reminded me of something that I had read in Luke. And um, so it actually picks up in Luke 13. So Jesus in Luke 13, he was teaching in the synagogues. And it was right after he got into a little dispute uh, with the Pharisees. And so he was healing people and and preaching. And the Pharisees came and they they were kind of upset with him that he healed somebody on the Sabbath. And so 
they accused him of that, and he got into this big dispute with them. And then where we pick up is right after that dispute. The Pharisees had went away, and then they came back. And we'll pick up in Luke chapter 13, verse 31. It says, At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. And so let's stop right here for a second. Um, this isn't a small, idle threat. Like, I want you to put yourself in Jesus' shoes here. We could rewrite over this, but, man, Herod's not, not a guy to play with. I mean, some of us would say, like, Herod was about that life. Like, Herod will, he'll, he'll cut your head off. Like, he, cause a few chapters before, he cut Jesus' cousin head off. So I'm thinking Jesus is probably like, oh man, now the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees don't like me. Now Herod wants to cut my head off. And Jesus knew that. He knew the deal. But I love his response. And when I read this, I, I'm sure I've read this tons of times. And I've never, I've never read this and it stuck out to me. Jesus replied, go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow and on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. So my paraphrase of verse 32 would be, look, you go tell that weasel that I came here to do what I was sent to do. And I'll continue doing what I've done yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I'm not going to stop until I'm finished. Go tell that weasel. That's my paraphrase. And then the next verse, and hey, if I die doing it, no better place than to die right here in Jerusalem. So I got to imagine that Jesus' response is certainly not what the Pharisees thought they were fixing to get out of Jesus. I'm pretty sure, you know, man, we're just going to throw Herod's record at him. Herod's trying to cut your head off, man. You better get out of here. And Jesus' response was, go tell that fox. So the title of my message tonight is, go tell that fox. Go tell that fox. I couldn't wait to say that. <laughs> Go tell that fox. So really, I think what I like about it is the spirit behind the phrase, go tell that fox. And I, I don't like arrogance, and that's not what I mean uh, by go tell that fox. What I do mean, though, is the spirit behind that is posturing yourself for perseverance. Jesus was postured for perseverance, and we need to be the same way. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. We don't finish that so often in our minds. We think, let's not become weary in doing good, for in the proper time, we'll reap a harvest, period. And then when we don't reap the harvest in the right time, we're ready to give up. But then it goes on to say, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. James 1.12 says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So how do we do that? It's a whole lot easier to preach than it is to walk out. (laughs) I know that. So um, this this morning, to help us to to figure out how we're going to do that, I put together 14 ways that we can posture ourselves for perseverance. But thankfully and lucky for you guys, I condensed it to four. So I don't have 14 points, <laughs> just have four. So the first one, couldn't wait to say that too. So the first one, the first way to posture yourself for perseverance is you have to get direction and vision directly from God. You have to get, you have to get a word from God. You have to get direction and vision directly from God. You can't get it from mom. You can't get it from dad. Well, unless you're living with mom and dad, then you can get some vision from mom and dad. But once you, once you start, once you get out of that house, man, you got to get direction from God. So often we'll rely on direction and vision from somebody else. But when times get hard, we'll go to that person and say, but you said we have to get direction and vision directly from God. Jesus never wavered in the face of discouragement adversity, or anything else that would try to stir fear up in him because he got his direction and vision from God. He says that in John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. 
And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up from the last day. He got his direction and vision from God. And when we read that and when we read the Bible, we see that God speaks. But so many times we don't live like God speaks. We'll read like God speaks. We'll create theology like God speaks. We'll even have discussion about one time when God spoke, but we don't live like he currently speaks all the time. And I'm not preaching at you. I'm, I'm preaching to me too. I had to preach to me before I preached this um, with you guys. And so I thought, you know what? God used to speak. He still speaks and he's going to continue to speak. And I'm not going to go through these on the screen, but Genesis 6, 13, God said to Noah, Genesis 12, 1, God said to Abraham, Exodus 3, 14, God said to Moses, 1 Kings 19, the Lord God said to Elijah, Jeremiah 1, the Lord said to Jeremiah, Acts, New Testament, 9, 4, Jesus said to Saul, you know, in 1979 or 1980, God said to Brother Francis to build this church and we're now sitting here because God spoke to him and he took time to seek the Lord. In 1991, I just checked with Pastor Todd. That's the year he got called into full-time ministry. He's leading this church and pastoring this church because God said and he listened. God speaks. But even further, when God speaks, some of you have heard this before, when God speaks, God creates. He doesn't just speak. He, He creates when he speaks. He spoke the world into existence. He said, let there be light. When he said, Noah, build an ark, Noah wasn't already building an ark. He said, Noah, build an ark, and then he started building an ark. I'm sure he probably didn't want to build an ark, but I'm glad he listened because we're here, you know. Um, And then when God created the desire and equipped him to build that ark, his purpose came to pass. One more, one more example. Moses led people out of bondage because God spoke to Moses and he obeyed. And so when God speaks, he creates. I don't want to rush just to get to the next point. I want to ask you, what is God speaking to you? We don't like like silence, and so I'm going to be silent for a little bit because I want you to think, man, what is God speaking to me? If I just preached and I, and I didn't give you a chance to respond, even in the middle, I, I'd waste your time. What, what is God speaking to you? Some of you might, as soon as I ask that question, boom, something might have hit your mind, and it might have might have made you a little worried. It might be intimidating. Maybe it was comforting, or maybe maybe God hadn't said anything, or maybe you haven't heard him, and we'll get to that later, but God is speaking. You know, I was praying about, man, Lord, you know, it's been a while since I'd heard you speak on a subject or on these subjects, or, and I was kind of just talking to God about that, and these are some notes that I had wrote down in my journal. Some of us, and I I said me, but some of us have no perseverance because we have no direction. And some of us have no direction because God hasn't spoken. And maybe he hasn't spoken because we haven't sought after him the right way. And so as I I thought, I said, well, God, I pray. I have a devotional time. But the Lord, what he had showed me was, hey, when I speak, I usually tell you in different seasons and in different ways than I did in the the season before. And so I had to learn to move with him. But he, he encouraged me with this verse, and I want to encourage you guys with Jeremiah 33. Verses 2 and 3. This is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. He said, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not yet know. In John 16, 12, he says, I have much more to say. This is Jesus talking. I have much more to say to you more than you can now bear. So he's telling his, his disciples, look, I'm not finished talking to you. I have a whole lot more to tell you, but you can't hold the weight of it right now. But when he, the spirit of truth, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why 
I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. So the first thing to posture for perseverance is get direction and vision from the Lord. The second thing is build an altar. Build an altar. Of course, I'm not talking about, you know, go build a big physical altar um, in your backyard, although I, I do know someone who did that, and it, it means a lot to him. So if you did that, I'm not, I'm not knocking you. That's really cool, but um, I'm not telling everybody to go build a physical altar. But once again, I'm, I'm getting at the principle behind the altar. I believe that one of the principles behind an altar is remembering and reflecting. Remembering and reflecting. I think it's important that once God speaks and once God gives us direction, that we make an altar. We write it down. Today, I think a modern day altar is when we write it down in a journal or we write it down on a notepad or a sticky pad or some way that we can remember, man, I believe this was from the Lord and I'm going to need to refer back to this. And that's why God says in Habakkuk 2.2, 2, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of an end and will not prove false. I love this part. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. So write it down. Amen. Write it down. So uh, because there will come a day to where you'll say, man, God, I thought you said this. Or there'll come a day when God has said something that hasn't yet come to pass. Or there might come a day to where a conversation that you've had with God once brought faith and hope and energy to you has now become a, like a faded, vague memory that no longer causes your heart to beat. And when that time comes, you got to go back to that altar. You got to go back to that altar. I found this um, in Genesis 12, something that Abraham did with the Lord or, or co labor with God. In Genesis 12, 1, he says, The Lord has said to Abraham, Leave your country, your father, uh, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. So I, I love that part. Go to the land that I will show you. Like they didn't have MapQuest or Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn or Google Maps. Like none of that stuff was a thing. So this is a lot of trust. So go to the land that I will show you. And all of these promises God told him. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. That's huge. All the people on earth. What if God told you, all the people on earth will be blessed through you on earth? Not in Lafayette, on earth. That's what he told Abraham. So Abram left as the Lord had told him. And so the rest of, of the verse, he, he goes on to, to move to where God told him to go and is kept in step with God. But when we get to verse 7, it says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. A chapter later, we know a lot happens in a chapter, but a, a chapter later, it says in Genesis thirteen four, And where he had first built an altar, there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So Abram returned, and I guarantee you when he went back to that altar, I don't know about you guys, but man, whenever I go back to something that's nostalgic, wow, it brings back feelings. Sometimes, I don't know if you ever go to a place that's real nostalgic or even think of it. I've heard people say it's like they could smell that they're there. It brings everything back. And so I believe that when Abram went back to that altar, man, it was nostalgic. It was refreshing. He, he looked, man, look where God has taken me. Look where God has taken me. We can build an altar with the, the, the direction and the vision that God gives us just by writing it down. When I go back and things that I've journaled that, that I feel the Lord has promised me, some of it's come to pass. And it's exciting. And it excites me to look at the things that haven't come to pass yet and think, man, God, you made a way where there was no way. And I believe you're going to do it again. I believe you're going to do it again. And so the third thing is, allow discouragement to fuel you, not fool you. I'm going to say that again. Allow discouragement to fuel you, not fool you. The thing about perseverance, and this might sound silly, is that it wouldn't be necessary 
if it weren't for discouragement. The thing about perseverance is it wouldn't be necessary if it wasn't for discouragement. And I only say that because perseverance is a word that we so easily use when everything is going well, but it's so hard to apply when things aren't going so well and things are tough. But it's in that time we have to remember that, man, it's not, it's not discouragement. It's not the purpose of discouragement to fuel you. I mean, to fool you. It's to fuel you. Use it to fuel you. And so I had a, another story I wanted to share. You know, when I first got saved, a good friend of mine really, um, really took me under his wing and showed me where to find James in the Bible. You know, I didn't even know where to flip. I just opened up in the middle and jumped in the Psalms. But man, he showed me how to, how to read the Bible and how to pray and all that. And I asked him one time how he got saved and he told me that story. But then I asked him, well, why do you do stuff like this? Like, why? Why do you take people and show them how to read their Bible? And I didn't know you called that discipling, but why do you disciple pretty much? And he said, you know, man, I got saved when I was just a kid. He said, I was probably 12 years old. And he said, when I was about 15 years old, I was the most on fire for God that I ever was in my life. And my dad took his own life. And he said, and I, I processed that really by myself a lot in my room. You know, his mom was there for him. And he had family there for him. But while he was processing that, he said, it wasn't out of resentment. It, you know, it's not something that if the feeling fades, I'm going to get out of ministry. He said, but the thought just hit me. He said, man, I'm going to make the devil sorry for the rest of my life that he took my dad because I'm going to populate the kingdom of heaven with everything I got. See, what he did was he didn't let discouragement to fool him into thinking it was God's fault. He let it fuel him in the direction of God. I want to look at a, a verse in uh, again, Luke thirteen thirty one. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. If I were in that position or if you were in that position, like you might have a Herod situation right now. Jesus could have done this. He could have thrown his, his hands up and said, all right, that's it. I had enough. All right. God, I know you sent me down here to save the world, but you gave me Disciples with an IQ of 30, I got to explain things like three times to them every time, and they still make mistakes. Got Herod cut my cousin's head off, right? Uh, dude, I don't have a home. I'm walking everywhere. I mean, you, you, you could have sent me at a time where they had some better shoes. I mean, I, my feet are falling apart here. You know, I, there's no microphones. I got to holler. And he could have just went off about how... It was terrible. And now Herod's trying to cut my head off. I'll quit. I'm done. Tell Herod, don't worry about it. I'm going to just go back to being a carpenter. He could have said all that. He could have quit. But instead, the Pharisees didn't fool him. They fueled him. I love reading 32 and 33 again. Jesus replied, go tell that fox. I'll drive out demons and heal people today, tomorrow, and on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today, tomorrow, and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. In other words, no better place and time to die right here doing what God called me to do. It fueled him because it reminded him that if he didn't do what his father sent him to do, the Pharisees would continue to oppress people with a law with no end, and that salvation would never come to mankind. And so it fueled him. It fueled Jesus to say, I don't have to do this. I want to do this because my father sent me to do it. And just like Jesus, we've all been put here with a purpose. And other people depend on us fulfilling that purpose. I want you to think just right now, I want you to think of the circle of people around you, your circle of influence. Maybe it's people at work. Maybe it's the aggravating people at work. Maybe it's other parents. Maybe it's parents at the ball field. Their son's better at baseball or their girl's better at soccer, and they just can't tell you enough about it. And I don't know what it looks like for you, but everybody has a Herod. Everybody has a Pharisee, and everybody has an opportunity to be fooled or to be fueled. Which one are you, are you giving into? Ask yourself, which one are you giving into? The world around you needs your perseverance. And now the final key to posturing yourself for perseverance is to encourage yourself in the Lord. 
is to encourage yourself in the Lord. And this morning when I said 14 things, I really did have 14 things. <laughs> I really did. And I could have kept going. And what's funny is when you're in the middle of having to persevere, it seems like you can't come up with one. But man, the Lord is so faithful. If you just seek after one, he'll give you two. And if you just seek after two, he'll give you three. And before you know it, you've got nothing but reasons to persevere and ways to go about doing it. And encourage yourself in the Lord. So once you get God's vision and direction for your life, you need to build an altar. Once you build that altar, you got to allow discouragement to fuel you, not fool you. Then you got to encourage yourself in the Lord. Luke 5, 16 said, so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Talking about Jesus. So the most powerful person ever walked the face of this earth was Jesus. The most impactful person was Jesus. He didn't just impact people on earth. He impacted people for eternity. The seeds he planted made eternal difference. And it's because of those seeds that we can make eternal difference with seeds we planted. That guy, he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. We are not too busy. That's a lie. I mean, we all fall into it. I fall into it. But we're not too busy. We're not too busy. First Samuel 30, chapter 6. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. Because the soul of the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God, in the Lord, his God. And so as I finish this point, service is not over, but I, I, I want to add something to the end of the service. Um, why don't you guys go ahead and stand with me? And we're going we're gonna to worship again just one more time. But before we do... I want to just read a few things to you. And I don't know how you receive, but I want you to take this into worship. And after this song, I'm going to come back up and have a few other things to say. This is the participation part of the message. David said it's, he, he strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. I want you to strengthen yourself in the Lord your God, which is the same God of David. And I'm going to declare some things over you. I want to say this before we get into worship and before I read these things. No one and nothing can take you out of God's purpose for your life or out of God's will for your life but you. And no one can accept God's purpose for your life and God's will for your life but you. You're the difference maker. So nobody who's difficult no, no, the Pharisees, the Herod, they can't do that. Only you. And so I want to read a few scriptures over you. John 10, 28, 29. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, children. And have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Romans 8, 11, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Isaiah 54, 17, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the inheritance of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Now as we worship, as the worship team starts to pick up the beat, one more scripture, Isaiah 43, 16 through 19. This is what the Lord says, he who made a way through the sea, a path through mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together. And they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wilderness. Let's worship together.
where you are, I just want you to just close your eyes. And just like we did at the beginning, I want you to envision what seems like it's an obstacle to you. And I want to declare that one more time. And before I do, I just want to ask everybody in this room, you have an opportunity to have the God that I was just talking about on your side. Like I said, no one can take you out of his hand. Nobody can take you out of the will of God. But first, you got to be submitted to the will of God. You have to get saved. That's what the Bible calls getting saved. It's surrendering to the Lord. Listen, Jesus died not so that you could clean yourself up and then go to him. He died so he could clean you up when you go to him. And so right where you are, I just want to ask you, just everybody just close your eyes. I don't want you to feel uncomfortable. This might be your first time. It might be your 20th time. Regardless, maybe you've never made the decision to say, Jesus, I've heard a lot about you. I, I know about you, but I've not experienced you. And I want that. I want you in my heart. And I want you to guide my life. I want to give my life to you. If you've never done that, there's no shame in admitting that. Everybody in this room is at one of two places. Either they've done that and they're still right with God, or they've never done that. And so I just want to ask you, everybody's eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to ask you to come up, but if that would be you, just slip your hand up for me real quick, just so that I can see it. And I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you. Don't be bashful. Don't be ashamed. Nobody's looking. I'm going to take a few moments. I see your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? I see your hand. Praise God. This is the one moment I don't want to rush. We got time. If you're still debating, it's okay. But listen, the Lord came down here and died for you. If that's you in here. And you'd say, I don't know for a fact that I'm right with God. You can, you can know before you leave tonight. Now for the rest of us, for those of you that raised your hands, we're all going to pray this prayer together. And Listen, if you mean this with your heart, this is the best thing you can ever say with your mouth. And so everybody just pray this prayer with me out loud. Lord Jesus, I know that I fall short of your heavenly standard and nothing I could do could get me to that standard. Lord, I want to be forgiven of sins that enable me to fit that standard. I love you, Jesus. I ask that you come into my heart, clean my heart, and be the Lord of my life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you just pray that for the first time, the Bible says you were born again. That means you had a second birth. That means of spirit you've been born again. If, if you did pray that prayer, there's a card in the pew right in front of you. Um, and just go ahead and fill it out. It says, I made a decision. Um, and there's a pencil there too. Just fill that out. Come bring that to me or the info center after service. But for the rest of us, I want to do one more thing. I know it's very interactive. But as we're imagining things that are discouraging or things that maybe have happened in life and it might have been three or four years since you've actually prayed in faith for something. I want to give you the opportunity to come and pray with somebody tonight. Sometimes just confessing that to somebody, sometimes just praying with somebody is really what you need. And so if we have any, any altar workers, I would just I would like to ask you to just come forward. I'd like to open up the altars. And we're just going to do just the bridge of that song one more time. And the rest of you guys, you are dismissed. Feel free to worship as people come up for prayer. But I really want to encourage you to come up for prayer. I don't want that to be a, a thing that, that fades off. It's so important. I just want to pray a blessing over you as you go. Lord Jesus, I just pray that everybody that's here tonight, Lord, I pray that you would give them the grace that they need for every day. God, you taught us to pray for our daily bread. Lord, I pray that tomorrow when they would get out of bed, you'd give them exactly what they need. I pray they'd be drawn to seek after you. Lord, I pray that they would have ears to hear you and eyes to see the things that you want to do for them in their life. Lord, I break discouragement off of every person in here and I just loose the encouragement of God over their life. 
Lord, I pray that tonight be the night that things have been broken that haven't been broken for a while. And Lord, I pray that we get to hear of testimonies of things that you're doing. Because God, we know we've seen you move and we know that you're not done and you're going to do it again. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask. Amen. While the song's coming on, you guys come up for prayer if you need something. I love you guys. Go have a good night.